It's Sunday, January 10th, 2016, and this is the Product Mentor Talk. Today we're joined by one of our mentors, Mark Abraham, Senior Product Manager of NotOnTheHighStreet.com, and he's going to be leading a talk today on creating and managing product roadmaps. Um, so for those of you who may be joining us for the first time today, let me just briefly explain the format. The people you see along the bottom of your screen here are mentors and mentees within the Product Mentor Program, uh, the current session, session four of the program. Um, and mentors and mentees in the Product Mentor Program uh, get paired up for a period of six months basically to help make better product people, better product decisions, better product managers. Um, and so those are the people you see in the, on the bottom. But we also open this up to everyone else, everyone else meaning the rest of you on the internet watching us live stream probably at theproductmentor.com slash live. Uh, so definitely feel, and so this is opened up to everybody to be able to ask questions. Um, so you see questions from in the room and out of the room. Um, and so what we're going to quickly do is just go around with some introductions and I'm going to go in the order that they appear on my screen and I apologize if I call everyone by their wrong names in case they're logged into uh, some different accounts. So first I'm going to just start with Rachel. And also as you introduce yourself, uh, Mark has asked everyone to uh, state one pro a problem or a challenge they have with roadmaps. Thanks. Rachel? Hi. Uh, I seem to be having a backlighting issue, but uh, I'm here. I promise I'm not just a silhouette. Um, <laughs> and one issue that I have is, so I work for Mark Cuban Companies, and uh, so I have to work with companies very, very quickly and get to understand them fast. So what is the quickest way I can develop a roadmap and figure out what a company has to do um, and, and move with them quickly is probably my biggest challenge. Thank you. That's great. And are you a mentor or a mentee? Mentee. There you go. And Mark? Hi, my name is Mark Abraham. Um, I'm a mentor of the program. Ment uh, mentor of Lonnie is also on the call. Give me mental support. Uh, and I'll be talking today about product roadmaps. Excellent. And Lonnie? Uh, hi, my name's Lonnie Rosenbaum, uh, mentee in the program, as Mark just mentioned, uh, product manager at a company called Booker based in New York City. Uh, and my main issue with road mapping is finding time on a regular basis to make sure that I'm putting consistent thought and really deep enough thinking into roadmaps. Yeah, thanks. Excellent. And Jonathan. And Jonathan's muted, so he's going to unmute himself and try again. Sorry about that. How's that? All good. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, my name is Jonathan. I'm a director of product management at Schoology, also a mentor in the program. Uh, and I think, you know, what we're trying to, we're, we're constantly trying to strike a balance between visibility of the roadmap that we can share with the our front office and sales teams uh, with agility and, and um you know, being able to course correct and adjust. And yep. Jens. Hello, Jens. All right, we're going to go to Bennett. who seems to also be having some technical problems. Uh, <laughs> no problem. So I'm going to get going with my part. Uh, and so just so, and I am Jeremy Horn. I'm going to be moderating. I'm also known as the product guy. So as questions come in from the room or really the rest of the Internet, I'll be passing them on uh, to our, uh, our mentor today, who's Mark. And uh, with all that said, let me hand it over to you, Mark, um, to take it away. Thanks so much, Jeremy. I'm going to go to my slides. Great. So today I would like to talk about roadmaps and creating and managing them, as, as Jeremy said in the introduction. Making sure I get to the next slide. Just bear with me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
So why this talk? I want to talk about a roadmap. I know, you know, from hearing you talking about as part of the introduction about your challenges, we all use roadmaps, but I've seen roadmaps being used in lots of different uh, templates, lots of different purposes. And what I would like to do is really talk about the value and some of the pitfalls uh, in terms of creating and managing roadmaps on a daily uh, basis as product managers. The first message that I want to get across today is don't treat your roadmap as a loose collection of timings and features. So if any of you on this call are currently using a template like you see on this slide or you work in organizations where they use a template like this which effectively is a bunch of features with some timings against it, my hope is that by the end of this session today you'll revisit that template and look at it differently. The second thing I'll I want to get across in today's session is the importance of taking a step back before you delve into creating a roadmap and I think this alludes to what Lonnie was saying about being able to put some thought into your product roadmap and I think that thought on a regular basis comes from thinking about a product vision and having a product strategy, having product and business objectives that your roadmap aligns with. Too often I see product managers delving straight into creating a product roadmap without taking that step back and thinking about your vision and strategy. So that's the second thing I would like to get across today. So um, as in terms of the outline of the talk, what I'm looking to do, it's, it's about 3 o'clock now. We've done our intro, 10 past 3, I'll take you through some examples. 20 past 3, we'll look at vision and strategy, then half past 3, we'll talk about creating and managing and we'll at the end I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. And so for those of you joining us uh, from the from New York City or the East Coast, uh, those, those, those times are uh, London time, so uh, Eastern time would be 10 a.m. So thank you for that Jeremy, because what is wrong with that period, you know, it's a shame I can't see your faces, but I was curious you know, I would love to know what you think is wrong with, with that picture, with that outline that I just took you through. Uh, just, just going back to that. So, first of all, a few practical things. Like uh, Jeremy just mentioned, those timings don't mean a thing to you because we're all in different time zones, for one. The other thing is that this using this kind of template suggests that it's all very linear and very predictable. But I don't know if I'm going to spend, you know, a bit more time on a particular topic than on other topics that will come under or go over. Um, equally, as Jeremy said, right at the start of this session, it's not a linear process in the sense that there's only room for Q&A at the end because I'm happy to take your sessions throughout. And the other thing I would say is that it looks very linear, but I can tell you already that I'll be flip-flopping between topics. There'll be overlap. I'll be referring back to certain things as I go through the presentation. But the biggest thing for me that's problematic about using this template for my outline today is that it lacks context. So for even simple things like examples, examples of what, creating and managing what. Um, so those are, that's for me the biggest problem. You can't understand from just looking at this outline why I'm looking to cover certain topics and why maybe not skipping over other things. So I'd rather use a template which looks a bit like this which, as you can see, if you look, I've taken the timings out, for instance, and it's much more fluent in a, uh, fluid in a sense that if you look at the, the top line where it says name, I've got some high-level themes that I'm looking to cover today. And again, not in a very linear kind of fashion, because I will be going back at, backwards and forwards, but it's much more focused on the things uh, that I want you to get out of today's session and, and con conversation. Right, so what I'll do is I will talk about the why behind roadmaps, just setting the scene, understanding about what's the value of roadmaps, what are some of the pitfalls to consider when it comes to roadmap. I'll talk about the importance of taking that step back, so thinking about your product vision, your strategy before you create a roadmap, and then we'll talk about what's involved in actually creating and managing a roadmap on an ongoing basis. So let's start with the why behind roadmaps, the benefits and pitfalls of using a roadmap. And again, this is purely to set the scene briefly so we're all on the same page in terms of what a roadmap can do for you as a product manager or for, your, for the organizations that you work in. First of all, it provides business and product direction. I think that's a really key benefit of having a roadmap where even though things, as we all know, on a roadmap, 
can change, and we'll come back to that later on. It gives a clear outline on what we're looking to achieve and why, what the overarching direction is. A second benefit of having a roadmap, it's a nice way of combining business and product objectives and strategy in one kind of really clear tool. A third one is continuity of purpose. So again, like I said, a roadmap is likely to evolve, things might change, but again, the overarching purpose that aligns with your roadmap should remain fairly stable. Um, too often, and again, that's my problem of having roadmaps which are just a bunch of features with some timings against, and there's no overarching kind of purpose or direction, so it makes it harder for you as product people to deviate from it and to make decisions, because it feels like you're just making decisions willy-nilly. Product roadmap can be really useful at facilitating collaboration with internal and external stakeholders. Now we know we all know that that stakeholder collaboration comes with its own challenges. Um, but as a tool, and we'll talk about that later on today, but as a tool, it can be really good to bring everyone on the same page in terms of what we're looking to do, why and by when. The other benefit of having product roadmaps is it helps to prioritize. I always say about roadmaps, even if it's not a bad thing if you're deviating from a, a roadmap because things have changed and you deprioritize things on the roadmap in favor of other things that have come up, for example, but at least you've got something to deviate from rather than making those kind of trade-off decisions in a vacuum. And finally, roadmap can be a really effective communication tool. So if we think of our roles as product manager as the guy in the middle, like here, where we have to liaise with all those different stakeholder groups, a roadmap can be a really good living kind of document that you continuously can refer to to get people and keep people on the same page, uh, making sure you're all heading in the right direction. So those are the kind of key benefits of having a product roadmap. It provides direction, it creates continuity of purpose, it helps to prioritize, uh, it helps, it facilitates collaboration, and it's a, it, it assists communication. Let's start with communication, because at the same time, that can be one of the major pitfalls when it comes to product roadmaps. Um, I often see a problem starting as soon as people st stop referring to roadmaps when they make product decisions, for instance, or forgetting to update roadmaps or communicate roadmap progress. Um, that is a big risk because what effectively you've then done is create a one-off exercise which is lovely um, but if you don't keep referring to it the roadmap as such and the value it can provide to you and your organization becomes very limited to say the least. And I've got a quote here from a fellow product person just to illustrate that both the importance of constantly communicating your roadmap as well as the challenge of doing so. The next pitfall is that obviously as product managers we've got lots of different skills but I wouldn't say that being a clairvoyant is one of them and I think that's one of the problems with roadmaps commonly where as soon as you create a table or whatever template you use with some features and timings against it the expectation is immediately that those features or solutions are going to be delivered within the time frame set. Now we all know that that's not the case a roadmap is a really good tool to outline a plan and outline the key steps that you need to take, but we all know how, how likely things are to, are, uh, are to change. So that brings in the need to be flexible and appreciate and communicate as well that things are likely to evolve. Again, the good thing is with roadmaps that even though things will evolve, there will be changes, we might have to adapt to, let's say, market changes or technology changes, uh, customer changes. That's all fine. But the good thing on a positive note is that the roadmap at least gives you something to, to deviate from uh, rather than just responding to every single change willy-nilly. So just to quickly summarize um, why roadmaps. It provides strategic and product uh, direction. It gives us a rationale for decision making, allocating resources, whether it's people, effort, money, and it also helps us with tough prioritization and uh, uh, 
um, uh, prioritization and trade-off decisions. It's also a very effective communication tool if used correctly and it facilitates stakeholder collaboration as well as creating continuity of purpose. So uh, Jens had a question. I, I, I'll ask it if, uh, if he's not able to, but Jens, you want to try to ask your question? Do you, do you want to ask uh, Jeremy? Yeah. Looks like I'll be asking it. Um, uh, Jens was asking, uh, how do you create uh, a roadmap that's high level of no high level enough to uh, be to not be too uh, restrictive, but detailed enough to still be accountable? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And if it's okay, I would like to park that question, if that's all right, because we will talk about the actual creation of roadmaps a bit later on in the presentation. Uh, and one of the things I'll talk about is having goal-oriented and theme-oriented roadmaps where you've got high level enough but still clear themes to be accountable for. All right, sounds good. Um, and so just for everyone else, just keep the questions coming in at theproductmentor.com slash live. As the questions come in, I will pass them along. Back to you, Mark. Great. Just trying to get to the next slide, just bear with me. Right, sorry about that. So we talked about the value of um, roadmaps and we talked about the benefits, the pitfalls. Now I, talk, I want to talk about something that's very close to my heart and that's the importance of taking that step back. And I'd like to use this onion created by a friend of mine called Roman Pitchler where it's a nice way I think to visualize that the importance of looking at product vision first and then your product strategy and your goals before you then get into your product roadmap or even your product backlog. And again, what I want to make clear here today is that too often I see people going straight into the product roadmap without considering the overarching business of product vision um, and without thinking about a wider product strategy that your product solutions uh, will fit into. So let's start with the vision. So, just as an example, I picked a vision here from a company, and I don't know, for those of you um, that haven't seen my slides prior to this talk, have a think about the company that this vision might belong to, but as you can see, the, the overarching business vision of what, the, what drives the company as a whole, where I want to be in the long term, and what that key underlying motivation is for doing business in the first place, it's very broad. So the vision here is to create a better everyday life for the many people. It's fairly broad and open-ended, but if you then look at the actual company, it's, uh, it's IKEA, which I'm sure you're familiar with, the big Swedish um, furniture maker and seller. You can see that there is already you know, more detail to it. And even though it's a fairly kind of aspirational statement, you know, creating a better life for the many people, on a more uh, tangible level, to give an example, one of their product uh, principles is to design the price tag first. So that means that if you're a product designer at IKEA, the first thing you need to think of when you're designing a table or a chair is to think about affordability. Um, so that's a really simple example of how you can take a fairly high level business vision and translate it into a more tangible product principle and a product vision. To give you another example, this is the product statement for 
um, Mozilla Firefox. And the reason why I like this statement, because it's a good example of, of the point I made earlier about your vision, your business vision, your product vision remaining fairly stable. You know, these days when people talk about pivoting and stuff, that's all well and good, but I'd like to think that your vision remains fairly stable. How you get there and the tactics that you use and the strategy that you use to achieve your vision, that's likely to evolve and that will change, but overall your vision is likely to stay fairly stable. So take this one from Mozilla Firefox as a good example. This has been around for at least five years, and even though Mozilla have done lots of different things in that period, the overarching uh, vision has remained fairly stable. So take an example slightly closer to my home at least, because I, as Jeremy mentioned, I'm a product manager at nonhighstreet.com, which is a marketplace for small uh, arts and craft businesses, a bit similar to Etsy in the States. And the, the overarching business vision for um, Not on the High Street is to choose a life less ordinary, to create, create a platform where products that are less ordinary can be found, i.e. items that you wouldn't necessarily find on the high street. So when I started working here about seven months ago, and I work particularly with the, the B2B side of things, so I work with the sellers on the Not on the High Street platform, I had to think about, right, how can I translate that into a product vision that's relevant to my area, working, you know, working with the sellers, working as we referenced them, the partners on not on the high street. So you can see here I put in a short and a long version of that statement, but it was starting how I came up with these statements was thinking first of all, so from a partner perspective, how can I make it as easy as possible to showcase those products that you can't find on the high street on our platform? So that's just a, a concrete example. And you could say, Mark, that is, that is fairly high level, that's very fluffy. I think the characteristics of a product vision are that it needs to be quite aspirational, quite lofty. So you are allowed to think big, because the other key thing is that that vision needs to be motivational. You know, you need to be able to, people need to be able to understand it fairly easily and quickly. People need to buy into it, really important. And you can then still be able to, uh, use it for decision making. So if you think about it, if you think about product principles, like I gave you the IKEA example before, or you think about design principles, those are really simple ways of taking a high level vision statement like the examples I've just given you and translating it into something which is a lot more tangible and that we as product people can use on a day to day basis. The other thing to point out here is that we need to be very clear on the difference between a product vision, which is you know, your overarching goal and your strategy. So they're two separate things and obviously a strategy is a way to achieve your vision, but it's not one and the same thing. So, so we've got a vision, but we still need to take that step back. We, we've got a vision, but we're not quite there yet because the, the next thing I would like you to think about is the business goals and translating those into specific product goals that you need to achieve. So you can call them goals, you can call them key performance indicators, KPIs, or you can call them objectives, key results, OKRs, which I'm personally a big fan of. I don't know if you're familiar with OKRs. They were created by a guy called John Doerr at Google. And what I like about OKRs is that it's a nice way of setting an objective, explaining what the problem is that you're looking to resolve and what the results will look like. So to give you a simple example, you can see with this sample OKR, you've got a high level objective, which is to become the number one rated iOS photo editing app. And then you've got uh, some smart results there that are timely, that are measurable, that are achievable. Um, and it's a nice way to break it down. And you'll see later on when we talk about um, creating the roadmap and <clears throat> coming back to Jens's question around how do you keep it high level enough but still have some accountability for me as a product manager? This is a nice way of doing it because you're not honing in on specific features but you still have particular results that you can be held accountable for. I would say, by the way, if you look at this slide in more detail, I personally have a problem with key result number one on there which seems to suggest that you would base everything on the most requested features uh, by customers. I personally have a problem with that and I'll come back to why I have uh, a problem with that kind of approach. 
take an example from my day job. Um, so a couple of months ago, after joining, I'd learned from from the looking at the data and from talking to sellers on the on the high street platform that there was a real issue around access to their sales data. Uh, so understanding how many units partners have sold through our marketplace, um, of which product, what the revenue was, we weren't providing that data uh, to most of our partners. So from that. I came up with a very simple objective, as you can see on this slide. So just enabling not on the high street sellers to make product and business decisions based on their not performance data. So think about decisions like how much stock do I need to keep? Are there particular products that are underperforming and I need to get rid of? And when you then look at the results, they're fairly high level. Um, so you think about, all right, we're going to aim to to enable all our partners to make data-driven decisions before and throughout Christmas 2015 or we're going to enable them to benchmark their sales data so they have more context before they make a decision. Um, and also to coming back to Rachel, the point you made earlier about how can I do this quickly, from my experience this is something that doesn't take days and weeks but just a simple kind of discovery workshop or some conversations with your key stakeholders or customers can already help you to build up this picture. So there's a thing here where I say but, because what I've seen often is that people, product people start off really well, so they come up with the vision, they look at the business goals, they'll translate those business goals into very specific user goals or product goals and they'll straight into creating a roadmap. And my point is that there is still a bit in the middle that I would like you to spend time on before you create a roadmap. And again, this is, I guess, Lonnie, what you were saying before about putting t thought into creating roadmaps. Because what I would like you to do is think about your product strategy, what I call the bit in the middle. So thinking about what are, what's the problem that we're trying to solve and for whom. Right, so you can see my example here that I used when I was thinking about that data proposition for partners. What are the outcomes that we're trying to achieve, both for the end user and for us as a business? Why? How do we know what the, what do these outcomes look like? What's the impact that we're looking to achieve, and why? Um, so just to, to visualize that kind of aspect, so you're effectively, what you're doing, I like this diagram because it shows how you're taking your, your business strategy where you do think about outcomes and where you want to be as a business and you reflect that into a product strategy before you go into the more concrete product design bit. So just to continue, my bit in the middle where I, in preparation for this data proposition, looking also at what your competition are doing, what are the market needs, what does the environment look like, doesn't mean that if you find out a competitor is already doing the idea that you had in mind that you should drop all tools and stop what you're doing but I think it is important to look as that as a, as a factor and to say well how can we differentiate is there enough of a niche for us to step into and equally important to think about all right so we know what value we're looking to provide and why but what does success look like how do we know that we're making the desired impact how can we measure that so just to finish off the <coughs> the, the my example of thinking about providing data access to all our partners on the platform before we wrote a, a single line of so, sorry I want to say one more thing so what I've learned is is so what again almost challenging myself so you, you know you started with thinking about we believe our partners have a need to have access to their real-time sales data great you could say that's a feature let's do it but why and that's a so what thinking about that impact so that they can make critical business and product decisions on an ongoing basis. So like I was just going to say before, before you do all your kind of roadmap stuff and things, think much more around your assumptions and hypotheses. So I've thought about your problem statements, saying these are the problems that I'm looking to solve, this is the impact that I'm looking to have. How do I know I'm doing the right thing? Is, that, is there a way I can validate that as part of my product strategy before I delve into a roadmap and commit a lot of time, effort and money to the actual implementation? So you've got some related assumptions here. <clears throat> well, for instance, I say my assumption is that 
the number one value that partners will get out of any whichever way I do it in the ability to see at a glance how their products are performing that's absolutely key to them if they can see it very quickly without having to do all kinds of data crunches that's awesome for these really busy partners who need to make snap products or business decisions and then you can translate that into hypotheses and I appreciate you could spend a whole dedicated session just talking about goal setting and assumptions and hypotheses for now the point I want to make here is that it's important to have a way to measure results basically you know thinking about what does success look like and, and making that as specific as possible as you can see with these examples here right so in the case of this data example that I mentioned before just as a <clears throat> as an example before we before we even got close to the roadmap before we wrote a single line of code in this example created a very simple prototype just I did it as a design prototype and got some initial validation around that strategy, around some of the assumptions and hypotheses that I showed you earlier, talking to it, sellers and using it as a conversation starter, saying, right, what do you make of this data? How do you use this data on other dashboards when you use Amazon or Etsy, for instance? Um, what, do you, what do you think this data represents? How do you use, you know, what kind of decisions would would you make on the basis of this data or in observing them as they were looking at the dashboard and playing with it again before we delved into the roadmap and really committed proper development time to it so these are some of the inputs to consider when you think about strategy and by no means I'm claiming to make this you know that this is a, a finite list of inputs but the point I'm trying to make here is that it's really important to to think about some of these inputs when you're thinking about your product strategy, the bit in the middle, whether it's thinking about your user needs, thinking about your target audience, whether it's certain constraints that you might need to take into account, your business model, these are all, <coughs> all kinds of factors that will have an impact on your ultimate roadmap and therefore need to be considered before you're getting into a roadmap which is effectively I see as a plan to achieve your strategy an outline which as we all know uh, will evolve but this is really the backbone of that roadmap that product strategy is really the spine that you can always fall back upon and, and that's so just, what so yeah I'm gonna just jump in uh, we've got some questions I'm gonna hand the first question over to Rachel they ask cool do you mind Jeremy that I'm gonna stay on the slides because I had a, a bit of a problem just tagging back and forth if you don't mind so you just have to, I'll still take the question, but you won't see my face. All right, all right. We'll have to remember what it looks like. Rachel? <laughs> exactly. Hi. Uh, this is really awesome. I'm enjoying it a lot. I'm wondering if, not so much of a, a, a precise question, but as you're going through this, can you share some things that are good questions to ask along the way to these stakeholders? Because, you know, uh, this slide here is actually kind of perfect. It's like, I could go through and ask, every single one of these but have you found yourself in a pattern of these are the three questions that always get me the best answers to define this middle strategy yes um, so, so the question is really just make sure that I understood it properly is when particularly at the strategic part right what are the key three key st uh, questions to focus on right especially well, when I deal with stakeholders Rachel and I think you're now back on mute but typically I really find that is it's the I guess the who what and and why question really so that sounds really kind of generic but let's let's break that out when they think about all right so who are we doing this for is a question when I think about strategy I think about a lot but I know stakeholders think about a lot as well so if I think particularly when I'm dealing with people in marketing and sales and in senior management team they think a lot about their their audience segmentation for instance so that's the who. The why is almost the second question, right? So it's really about what is the revenue and profit? What's the bottom line? What's the impact that we're looking to make on the bottom line? But equally, what's the impact that we're looking to make on, on user needs? And then people already at that stage, even at the strategy st stage, they want possible ideas and uh, ways to go. So that's the what aspect that I get asked a lot as a product person. Uh, so it's really, or you could say that's the how in a way, but once you've established what we're looking to achieve for whom and what success looks like, then already at the strategy stage, 
people want to have an understanding what the direction to go into. And again, I would encourage you not to think about that in a very kind of feature by feature kind of level, but think more broadly about certain constraints or the technology that you've got available or legal compliance that you need to consider uh, to determine the way that you're going to go your, uh, from a product point of view, if that makes sense. So for instance, you know, very broadly you might say, we're going to do, we're going to create an API or we're going to do, you know, some sort of modular kind of data dashboard, let's say, right? That's all you need to say at that stage rather than saying, oh, I'm going to have a button there and I can have a specific feature there where they can extract reports. I wouldn't go into that level of detail as part of your strategy, but it would be sufficient to say we're going to create a modular dashboard because we know that will provide a good experience going back to the you know the top factor on this overview here because it will really fit into our new user needs. It will help compliance. It will fit in with the technology that we've got available. Those are the kind of considerations that come up at um, the product strategy stage, whereas at the my point is that when you get to the backlog stage and you get to the actual roadmap stage and the design and development stage is where you start thinking much more about the detail of what those solutions should look like. Does that help? Looks like it does. Definitely. <laughs> I think the, the what does success look like was really just really the loose basic question I was interested to lead with. Okay. Well, I can, I can tell you more about that, and I will, if anything, just so you know, I will send all of you a follow-up email with some interesting links around some of the topics, just for, for further thinking and discussion, if you like. And I can tell you already that what does success look like is already in that email is one of the things that I'll share with you afterwards. Great. So we're going to go on to the next question. Next, <clears throat> next question comes from Stephen Sue. Um, and he, he's asking more for a clarification, I think. Um, uh, and Stephen's asking, are we talking about forming OKRs still, or is this still before OKRs? What is he say? So he's saying forming OKRs versus before OKRs. Yeah, he's trying to understand in your in your talk and in the sequence of the slides that and the information you're presenting. Are you still talking about creating OKRs or? Are you still talking about? I get. I would. I'm. I'm. I'm interpreting uh, like the precursors to the OKRs. Yeah. I like. I said. I don't want to talk necessarily about creating OKRs. I meant it more of making sure you've got OKRs in place. Um, and you know, typically those are going to be business level OKRs, which you can then translate into product OKRs. But like I said, I think talking about the creation of OKRs that's a whole another session in its own right. All right, good. Uh, so everyone, uh, just keep the questions coming in. You send the questions to theproductmentor.com slash live. Um, and as they come in, I will pass them along. Um, that said, uh, we just had another question come in, so I'm going to ask it. Um, and this is from Riti Yu. Um, and uh, it is an OKR-related question, but it, it seems like it might be still relevant to what you're talking yep. about. Um, and Riddy is asking, how do we balance OKRs with the new with the new requests that come in that might change the product the product delivery cadence? Yeah. So the I think the, the question you need to ask, uh, Rita, is when that when that request comes in, is what is the what's the impact the expected impact on the OKR? I think that's the the, the, the alignment I would look for is so also to come back to Rachel's questions before about you know what does success look like. You will have to make assumptions around and not be afraid obviously to, to deviate from your roadmap as I said earlier but to say right I've got this OKR I have to make a trade-off decision between feature A that's on the roadmap and feature B that has just come through as a request what do I think which feature do I think is going to make the most impact on that OKR which one is going to be, move the needle the most all right, that's all the questions we have right now. So again, just set, keep them coming to theproductmentor.com slash live, and I'll pass them along. That said, back to you, Mark. Thank you. Um, so yeah, just to, to quickly summarize, we talked about business vision, creating the product vision. We talked about thinking about the business and, and user goals to achieve. So to Steve's point, it's not so much about creating them at this point, but it's really making sure that if they're there, just you know, consider them and you could, like I said, you could have a whole separate session about what those goals, how you set those goals and I follow up with that separately. 
the point that I'm making, and I will reinforce later on in the presentation, is about focusing on uh, problems first. And it's very tempting for us as product people to delve straight into solutions because we see a problem and we want to tackle it. But I'm urging you to spend a lot more time thinking and really understanding problems before you delve into feature or roadmap mode. We talked about product goals being smarter using OKRs. And like I said, my overarching point is not to go jump straight into the roadmap, but think about that bit in the middle. Think about your product strategy, which ultimately forms the spine of your product roadmap. So that said, would like to talk about the actual creation of a, a roadmap. And I know there were some questions around how do you go about creating a roadmap? Um, and we'll talk about those as I talk both about creating a roadmap and about managing a roadmap. So let's start with what a roadmap isn't. And, and I, I pulled up this kind of quote uh, just to illustrate the next point I'm looking to make about what a roadmap is not. And it's not a wish list. So I've seen these roadmaps quite a lot where, you know, typically just a bunch of features, the timings, typically I always have the sense that they're either dictated by customers or by you know strong internal stakeholders but that's not what a roadmap is about and again that's why I believe in the importance of having that product strategy where you've a lot more context of why we are doing certain things and why we're not doing certain things um, so to give you a recent example when I went to this company and I came across these boards that they have hanging on the wall hope you can all see it um, where they had an event with it was a B2B company with some of their customers and had some of these product ideas on the wall this one was about an API and they asked them please vote for you know the idea that you would like us to implement the most and as you can see the API um, got a lot of first votes even someone went even as far as putting up a post in there and said pretty pretty please give me that API um, now I think the you know you could argue great strategy because you know you're listening to your customers isn't that awesome the problem I have with with purely relying on, on on your customers and using this approach for it is that you don't have the context so what you can't tell from from this exercise is why people are so keen on having an API um, what often happens is that when you ask customers to to vote for an idea of to say what they really want you to implement they often start speculating about things that you might want to hear and what you're missing as a product person is the is the why behind it the context uh, how does it fit in with their decision making process how will have a how will a particular product that they have an impact on their you know the quality of their lives or their workflows this kind of exercise doesn't tell you that um, you know, so therefore, it's so really just, yeah, I really encourage. I just want to jump in. We just had some other questions come in. The first Go one on. is from Tim Lynch, um, and so Tim is asking: Is there a guide for how many tangents or side requests that you have on your roadmap before you need to over overhaul the whole roadmap? <laughs> That's a good question. There is no guide. I think you need to be very critical and just purely look at, go through the exercise that I just mentioned when I answered uh, Rita's question about side requests coming in. It's just looking at, right, are they going to have, have moved a needle on some of our, uh, or the problems that we're looking to solve and some of our business objectives? And if they don't, please take them off. <laughs> it's that simple. There's no optimum number. Um, but it's really that question is, is this really helping to solve the problem? Is this really help us to, to meet our you know, business objectives or product goals? Right? So the next question comes from an anonymous individual. Ooh, mysterious. Right. Very mysterious person. Or perhaps they were named anonymous. Um, we should have a talk about that if that's the case. Um, and so this person is asking, do you need a proof of concept before proceeding with anything? And how do you get that proof of concept? Yeah, so going back to the question, so going back to the example I gave you with that data dashboard that I showed you, which was effectively just a very simple uh, Envision kind of prototype, clickable to some degree, but not clickable for most of the degree. Um, especially if you're looking at a slightly bigger project, which you're going to pump loads of, uh, potentially loads of effort into, lots of people to focus on it. 
I think to validate your 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 product strategy and your thinking, it is good to have a prototype. You could argue, say, Mark, you don't need a product strategy. You just come up with a bunch of ideas and you test them individually. Could do, but I know, especially if you work in larger companies, that's often not going to happen, unfortunately. And I think also, it's it's not a very sound method because you know the, the way you address problems will change, but it's really having the understanding of the problem that you need to lot, uh, spend a lot more time on. And I think that's why having a prototype and having that initial validation in place before you go all out is really valuable. All right. Um, so everyone, just keep the questions coming in to us at theproductmentor.com slash live. And uh, Mark, back to you to continue the talk. So the other reason why I've got a problem with that approach where a roadmap is only customer driven and you know it's the top 10 of most requested features like we saw earlier with the, with the OKR example is that you'll struggle to to capture what Rumsfeld calls the uh, you know the unknown unknowns the things we don't know we don't know so in, in my world the game changes the things that are not just simple hygiene factors that will really have an impact and I typically get those game changes from not asking my customers what they want but really observing them and using uh, prototypes to test things out and give them uh, l different options to consider and, and see how to use them and learn that way rather than just saying vote here if you want this to be implemented. So um, we, I showed you this example before and <clears throat> Let's just to talk about what I find problematic about this kind of template in a bit more detail um, is that I think there's a couple of things wrong with this this view but I think the main thing is that there's no context like I said before so there's a bunch of features very specific timings but I don't have any evidence here of the kind of thinking that went into the roadmap in the first place so I don't know why we're doing accounts uh, why we're doing a browse FS and IMAP, I don't even know what those things are if I'm not very close to the product development. That's a different story. Uh, and that's the problem that I have, the timings. I personally, as a product person, I'd be very careful of um, anyway because you might not hit them um, and we know what, how problematic that can be. But I think the main thing here is is that lack of context. There's no understanding of why and what has fallen out of this roadmap. And even if, like, Rita asked before if there's, uh, and also uh, Jonathan actually who talked about you know correcting your course, just using this as a collaboration tool and a communication tool is really hard because what do you do with this kind of template if someone comes to you, well can we have feature A instead of browsing FS which we've now got planned for the second week of June, it's really hard from purely looking at this template to answer that question and to to make a well-informed trade-off decision. Um, so those are the, the problems I have with that kind of template. It's not effective as a communication and a collaboration tool. All right. So just to summarize the why, the dependencies that you can't see on a template like I just showed you, and what I call you know suffering from solution sickness. So if you go back, you go straight into specific features, and that means that the moment you show it to stakeholders who are not as close to product development as you are, who might not be interacting with you on a regular basis, this is what they expect to be delivered within that time frame, and it will be really hard to move away from the specific features that you've committed to and that you've fixated on. So what I'd rather do is, is a template which is much more kind of open-ended, if you like, and one of the templates that I want to share with you is this one, a goal-oriented roadmap created by Roman Pitchler, who I mentioned earlier in the talk. Um, and what I like about this approach is that it focuses on the goal. So if you look at the third row on that template, it's the rationale, it's the reason why we're doing certain features. And the other one, going back to Rachel's point about how do, what do we know, how do we know what success looks like is looking at your metrics. You don't even have to put the hypotheses in the bottom line of that template that you can see on the slide, but just already thinking about right, what are we think? What do we think the metrics are that are going to be you know move that we're going to move the needle on through these ideas? And the other very practical um, reason why I like this template because it's very easy to add 
additional layers to it. So you could add a role for product discovery where you continuously want to spend time uh, prior to actually getting to work on something, doing a prototype like Steve asked me about or testing assumptions or testing hypotheses before you actually start implementing. Or you can have a role there to highlight certain risks and dependencies, especially if you have multiple teams that a roadmap applies to, you want to highlight that as much as you can. Right. So give you an example, I've taken a snippet from, from my roadmap from the last quarter uh, and appreciate that um, Lonnie I think has already seen this. But you can see I deliberately take out the feature row of this template because like I said I'm just always uh, conscious that as soon as you put a feature on there then you've committed and it, it's really hard to deviate from that solution and think about potential other solutions. I focus much more on your, if you like, the OKRs. So the goal, what's the high level goal, what are the tangible results that we're looking to rele um, release within certain time frames and what does success look like and what are we, how are we going to measure success through those metrics. Equally, you can use a template called, um, created by a guy called Bruce McCarthy based in the States and I will share the links with you afterwards. But as you can see, same kind of thing where he uses strategic themes uh, for each quarter. So again, you're not delving into features, but you've got overarching um, themes. So again, uh, I think I'd, I'd answer both Rachel's kind of uh, challenge and Jonathan's challenge around being nimble and being able to, you know, quickly put this together. These kind of templates, you know, enable you to do that fairly quickly because, again, you don't have to think so much about solutions, much more around the kind of themes or outcomes or goals that you're looking to achieve within a specific time frame. Right. Um, so we talked a bit more about creating the roadmap, we looked at best templates to use and the thinking that needs to go into it. The key thing here to talk about is stakeholder management. So first of all, typically, and I know it varies per organization, but typically it's the, road, the product manager who creates the roadmap, who owns the roadmap, and who is accountable for the roadmap. But obviously we have stakeholders to deal with, and those stakeholders can come from a from a range of um, teams and disciplines. I find this a really nice kind of visual to just look at um, the different people that will want to have a, you know, input into the roadmap or visibility of the roadmap and appreciate that is likely to vary per organization. But just to make the point that obviously as product managers we don't create the roadmap in, in isolation and we don't manage it in isolation. Right. So just to summarize when we talk about creation is don't fixate on features, you know, especially if you think about dealing with stakeholders. In my experience, it's much easier to have conversations with them around business objectives that you're looking to meet, problems that you're looking to solve, value that you're looking to um, create, rather than just talking about, shall we go for feature A versus feature B? Shall we put the but button there or the button there? much easier to talk about problems, goals, or themes instead. Make sure you don't lose sight of measurable results. So again, whether it's because then you, it makes it easier to um, deal with kind of questions around trade-offs, you know, those side requests that we talked about earlier, or making sure you're progressing. It's much easier if you've got tangible results that you're looking to achieve to assess that. And also, I would always uh, encourage you to consider adding extra layers to a roadmap to think about cross-team dependencies or other sort of dependencies and thinking about risks as well. Right. Um, we'll now talk about managing the roadmap. Yeah, we got next qu uh, qu Stephen Sue had an, has another question and I'll read it off. Yeah. Um, so Stephen is asking, uh, while, the goal, why, while the goal-oriented roadmap is great because it talks about why, don't we also need some implementation details that are concrete alongside it? Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Obviously, nothing, Steve, nothing stops you from adding those in. But particularly if you think about when you normally create a, a roadmap, which is slightly in advance, is you don't necessarily need to get into that level of detail. So if you want to work, and coming back to Jonathan's point right at the introduction, in a more iterative kind of way, 
that's the kind of detail that comes out of your sprints and when you look at your backlog and the actual planning. But at the early stage of putting a roadmap together, yes, obviously, if there's particular risks, technical and implementation risks, absolutely uh, highlight them. But more the kind of planning and the specs and all the rest of it, I don't think that necessarily needs to be in a roadmap. All right, that's all the questions we have at the moment, so keep them coming to theproductmentor.com slash live, and back to you, Mark. Thank you. So this is about the actual uh, management of a roadmap, and I think the key thing here is the, the stakeholder aspect, is really continuously working with stakeholders, and that's both your developers, um, people in sales, marketing, to keep them abreast of how you're doing, the trade-off decisions that we make, you know, a roadmap can be a great tool for you know transparency and, and alignment around what it is that you're achieving or looking to achieve and how you're progressing against some of those goals. And I've put this uh, quote here from one of my uh, product manager friends just to illustrate that point. So on that note, the key thing I want to stress here that the roadmap is not a one-off. Like I mentioned right at the beginning when we talked about the, some of the pitfalls around product roadmaps is that people do it as a one-off exercise, looks great, everyone loves the roadmap, great slide deck, but then it's you know just put on a shelf effectively and it's there to gather dust. It's a, we have to accept that it's, it's a living and breathing document um, that we constantly have to refer back to and, and, and maybe deviate from, as I said before. It's not set in stone, and I think as product people, we have a you know a, a clear responsibility communicating that to stakeholders internally, externally. Things will change, and that is fine because again, we've got a framework to deviate from. So, I'll give you an example, and I appreciate you might not be able to see it properly uh, <clears throat> because it is quite small print, but it's more about the colors. So, what I do at not the high street is that every week I present roadmap progress again to the senior leadership team, so the COO, the CEO. Um, and what it enables me to do is really to say, well, how are we progressing? You know, you can see, for instance, where I put amber is things that are, you know, at risk, whereas things in red are completely blocked. And what it helps me to do is, is explain why that is and maybe get the CEO to make a very, help me make a very tough trade-off decision. So, and you can see when you look at December, for instance, three, four, and five are on amber. Uh, coming back to the earlier questions around side requests, just sliding in, I put them on there to say these are new things that have come in. Let's have a conversation of of, of whether that should impact the overall priority order of things. And equally, like I said before about being able to add an extra layer to a template, you can see how much, you know, the importance of risk and dependencies there where related to the things in Amber, I explain here why they're in Amber, what the risks are, what the holdups are, and equally I do the same things for the things in red which are completely blocked. But again, hopefully that gives you a sense of how you can treat the roadmap as a as a living document and as a communication and collaboration tool with your with your stakeholders. Right, because it, it clearly links with something that we as product managers do almost on a daily basis, managing that kind of iron triangle, constantly making trade-off decisions between scope, time, and cost. Right. We talked right at the beginning when we looked at a contortionist about the importance of being flexible. So we, you know, we have to appreciate that we're going to deviate from roadmaps, so we need to update them. And the key thing is, again, just that visibility and, and, and having the right forums to, um, to share those updates, whether you do it through a, a weekly stand-up, whether you do it through a daily stand-up, whether you send out an internal email to, to everyone within the business giving them an update. I do things like what I call a product retrospective, um, which is effectively, you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with the normal agile team retrospectives where you look at you know, the health of the team and looking at process and continuous improvement. I do these sessions for a wide range of people across the business, whoever wants to, to join really, particularly people who are not so close to product development, to focus on the product, to really say, well, what did we release last month and how are those features or products actually performing? So looking at the data, but also looking at uh, using it as an opportunity to look ahead and saying, right, 
uh, Q4, what's, what's in green, what's actually been done, what is in orange, you know, what's pending and how we're progressing on some of those things, what is in red because it's blocked and we might not get to it. Again, having a constant conversation on the roadmap and the underlying rationale behind it. Another good example is this webinar, is a slide from a webinar I joined a few years ago by a company called uh, Get Satisfaction. <clears throat> and Get Satisfaction, they're a consumer feedback um, platform, if you like, used by lots of big brands. And in that webinar, the CTO of the company took us through the roadmap, and he didn't go into very specific features or commit to very specific timings, but he provided us with an underlying rationale for that roadmap and explaining about the key strategic drivers, which is, again, coming back to, I think it was Jonathan's question around how can you create some high-level themes with, while still keeping that you know, agility and flexibility to you know, deliver things within a certain time frame or deliver certain features and stuff. This is the kind of way to do it, I think, because you are talking about the key things that you're looking to achieve and you can be held accountable for, but you're not sharing the exact solution that you're going to provide. So that brings me to the uh, end of my, my talk, uh, and obviously I'm happy to take questions afterwards, but three things uh, I'd like you to take away, because we've talked about the value and pitfalls of roadmaps, we talked about taking that step back and thinking about your product vision, your strategy, or your goals, and we then talked about what's involved in creating uh, a roadmap and managing on an ongoing basis, basis, liaising with your stakeholders. So the three things in summary that I would like you to take away from this session is take that step back before you're uh, creating a roadmap. Really think about the problems that you're looking to solve and for whom and why and what the expected impact is. The other thing is providing that strategic context for the roadmap. I compared the, the, the product strategy as the spine that sits underneath your roadmap almost. And finally, don't underestimate the importance of stakeholder uh, communication when it comes to your roadmap. Thank you very much. All right, and we have a question that just came in from Rachel, so I'm going to hand it over to you, Rachel. Cool. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned a number of tools today, so I'm curious if you had 20 minutes to walk into a room and determine which aspect of a company's product vision was weak, which one would you use and how? Can you just, sorry Rachel, can you repeat that question one more time because I didn't hear it properly. I want to make sure I answer your question. Sure. So you mentioned a number of tools today, which was really awesome and I loved. Um, so I was curious if you walked into a room and had to determine which aspect of the company's product vision was weak, which tools would you use, and how would you dive in? And the product vision, right? Right. Um, tools. The first thing I would do is, if I'd look at that product vision, is really to say, I would do a comparison. So probably I would do is taking your vision, right, and actually looking at the product, that is, that's the first way to say, do the two actually correlate? Because it's really, you see how, I'm sure you know examples of companies where they've got a weak product vision, or they've got, sorry, they've got a really lovely product vision where we're saying, oh, we, we're trying to make life easier for our customers. And then when you look at the actual product, you know, within two seconds flat of walking into the room and saying, that's not working. Or one of the other things I do when you talk, ask me about specific tools, I'm a big fan of using value change from the consumer uh, to the business and vice versa because that's a way to really road test your vision to say, right, we've got a vision, we've got different aspects of the value chain or even if you want to do it through a customer journey, how much do the, these two talk to each other and how much, how much do they correlate or not? Very quickly, you can do that within half an hour and you'll see where the, where the gaps are. Does that answer your question? That's great. Thank you very much. No worries. Outstanding. Um, so again, thank you to our speaker, our mentor, Mark Abraham, Senior Product Manager of NotOnTheHighStreet.com uh, for today's discussion on creating and managing product roadmaps. And as always, the presentation will be posted to our SlideShare channel shortly. And also a big thank you from me, Jeremy Horn, the product guy, to everyone else who joined us today um, and the product mentor. And also don't forget, if you're interested in being a product mentor very much like today's speaker, 
Mark Abraham, uh, uh, to product people of all sorts, of all skill levels, of all types of backgrounds. Session 5 starts on May 1st. If you want to be a mentor, sign up today. And to sign up, you just go to theproductmentor.com, um, fill out a few questions, and I will be in touch. Um, and also, if you're looking to fill a new product job with a great product person, visit our very own free-for-all job board at theproductjobs.com. And with all that said, thanks, everyone, and I'll see you guys all in the next talk. Bye.